whose, pro whose primary purpose is to maximize the profits for their shareholders. Now, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, that's kind of the way business is organized. That's okay. And I'd say, just go ahead, you know, have fun with it, but don't use our money. You know, we've got, we've got the means to afford what we want to create uh, on our own. So I'll get into that uh, in, in just a moment. But you know, let's, let's take a look at, at the context of where, of how this uh, transformative initiative is emerging in America. Uh, the context uh, of, of public finance, of our concerns and our desires, is constrained by what I, what I just described. And, and you know, in election time, we think we're, we're, <laughs> we're hopeful, I suppose, but perhaps designed to the fact that there aren't going to be any big changes, uh, regardless of who wins. And of course, that's true, in part because, as you know, politics is pretty much controlled by the people who have the money. So there's an axiom there. If, if you do the converse, if you have money, you can control the politics. If the people don't have money, they don't control policy. And I think that you'll, that you'll see that uh, in the Princeton study that was done a couple of years ago, that that's very much the case. When they studied the last 40 years of, of how public policy was impacted by public interest uh, and by the very forceful initiatives that the people brought to the table, uh, over 40 years, they could not detect a statistically significant indicator that public interest was reflected in public policy. So in addition to wanting to fund our future and create a new prospect for us, we also need to look at how we're going to democratize our country and our capabilities by reclaiming control of our money. And the long and short of this is, let's keep our money at home and invest in ourselves. Now, when you have a bank that transforms that opportunity, because it's not like you just save the money you've got. You actually magnify it multiple times. So, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that in just a moment. But you know, the, the scenario that we're in reminds me of uh, this little cartoon, you know, kind of a cartoon character. We thought about the control of how uh, disabled we are to be effective in creating public, in public policy. My a little cartoon character, you know, who's, who's uh, taking on a bigger opponent, and he's flailing his arms, you know, like this, and the, and the opponent's just standing there with his head on his, the hand on his forehead, and while the guy swings away, ineffectively, but nothing to do. And of course, I think we all know who the, the hand is on the forehead. It's the big banks, the big uh, financial interests that basically control our political way. So, uh, we're not going to get anywhere in that that and that confrontation. We're going to have to do what, uh, we're going to have to try a new tactic, which would be to stop resisting and create, and create an alternative. Go off to the side, get your hands out of the control of the person who's got the bigger, uh, the, the bigger influence and capability of uh, determining what you get to do. So we have a, a, a systemic issue and simply put, it's that we don't have access to our money. So, the, uh, if we would reclaim our money and put it in a bank, what would it look like? Well, David mentioned an example of the uh, $258 million bond issue to create affordable homes. Uh, so I just pointed out yesterday that affordable housing doesn't sound like boxes of stuff, of things. But we're really talking about creating space for people to have lives, for them to be safe and secure part of the community. And this is, this is what our money, isn't this what we want our money to do? You know? that, it, so that illustration or that, that uh, brought up an opportunity to look at well, what it's, what's going to cost. At, at 7% interest, which sounds unbelievable to me, but that's what apparently they're talking about. At 7% interest for $258 million, we'll be paying $372 million over 20 years in interest alone. So we'll have to repay about $700 million for borrowing $258 million. Uh, this, of course, is a ridiculous way to spend money. But the truth is, on average, 50% of the cost 
cost of infrastructure is finance. Finance. So if you build a, as they did in, in Oakland, they built a six billion dollar uh, bridge, time, materials, design, all of that. They, it took six billion six billion dollars to finance it. So it's a twelve billion dollar price tag for a six billion dollar object. None of us would do that, you know, if we had a choice. But right now we don't have a choice because we're stuck at having to borrow outside of our means. If we had a bank, we'd have another choice. We could take that $258 million, uh, and, uh, and actually we, would, yeah, we, we could build more units for the same amount of money, of course, probably about two and a half times as many units of, of, of housing, as it were. Uh, but uh, that would be not a difficult thing for the city to do, to be able to come up with that kind of money. Because you would just capitalize, when you capitalize a bank, you're able to, again, multiply that about nine times. So in order to uh, get enough money to fund this project, uh, let's say if you had $50 million, which this city has buku dollars laying around in a variety of funds, use that to capitalize a bank, you'd have $500 million available for lending, $450 million in a very rough sketch of what that would look like. So your bank, in this, you could easily capitalize a bank of several hundred million dollars. So you have many more opportunities to do that. Now, you wouldn't lend the money to yourself if you had your bank and you capitalized it and you said, okay, this is part of our mission. You wouldn't lend it to yourself at 7%. You could lend it to yourself at 2%, you know? Save a huge amount of money. I think I've got a figure here of what saving 5% on a loan like that uh, would be uh, about $13 million a year times $2,260 million in savings at 5%. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that, and, and the money that you would be paying in interest would go back into your bank. So not only would you save money in this finance management, you'd make money. And the bank would use the money that it makes to build a bigger capital nest egg so that it can do more lending. So it creates a financial engine that allows your wealth to build and build and build, and you can start to really start to control the situation uh, once you separate the ties from borrowed money. Now, this bank is not a charity. Uh, it is not a lender of last resort. It's a bank. And uh, it has to be run professionally by bankers, and it needs to be able to um, uh, not only make it bills, but also support itself. So, but it, it doesn't have to maximize its profits so that it's able to then make lower cost loans uh, as well as, uh, as, it, as it moves along. Now that's a, that's a huge advantage, of course. Another aspect of our environment, our current environment, the last time I was here, um, the news supported, uh, and announced that Jones to the group, the Socially Responsible Investment Committee of the city had recommended that the city pull out $43 million that are currently invested in Wells Fargo, in part because Wells Fargo was using your money to prop up trade uh, um, payday loan businesses. They were one of the largest investors. And of course, you know what payday loan business does to people who are poor. It takes advantage of them, keeps them stuck in a cycle of poverty, and diminishes the, the, their potential uh, to participate in the economy uh, and to make their uh, contributions in the community as well. Well, I, I looked at the treasurer's report uh, as to what you've got invested in Wells Fargo now, and it's gone up 50%, looks like. You're at $64 million sitting in Wells Fargo. And that's on top of, or that's on top of the $100 million that this city has on deposit in Wells Fargo. So you see out of how out of control our relationship is to our money. It's our money, after all. And it, we have abrogated the control and the responsibility of <coughs> making book, making bank uh, on, uh, on using it while it sits there and does nothing for us, except that when we want to when we need some, we have to go to their door and beg, and particularly compete in the marketplace, uh, and then pay outrageous fees for their management. Which, by the way, you can you have a 
great deal of uh, trouble finding out how much they're charging you for management fees. And you just would not believe what some of these zeros look like in those instances. Um, by the way, this, is, this, this uh, lack of transparency in the management of public dollars, see, it seems to me a violation of the public trust. But you're not able to see what they're doing with your money. But by contract, they'll say, it's a trade secret. We can't tell you what we're charging. Well, we do know from a variety of uh, other uh, of instances what it could look like. Uh, in New York, uh, the, the state pension fund there just uh, disclosed that it spent $3.1 billion in fees for subpar returns on their pension fund. In New Jersey, last year, they spent $701 million in fees, half of which were bonuses, to manage their pension fund. And that, again, subpar performance for the most part. So um, this is a, uh, uh, an untenable and a ridiculous situation that we need to, to, to get out of. Now, and, and so, and we can do this because it's in our rights to get to the bank, uh, and we just have to kind of organize ourselves around getting, uh, getting it underway. And I'm happy to report that the, that the word is getting out, the momentum is building around the country. Uh, we have some very good news out of New Jersey, of all places, that uh, the state of Chris Christie, you may know that name, uh, Mr. Christie has, uh, has conducted a variety of uh, un unfortunate uh, circumstances and events and, and investments. His wife is a, a Wall Street uh, banker. Uh, his, uh, He's really ruined the state in a lot of ways. He's not, doesn't have a very, not very popular. Well, out of the, out of the, uh, uh, the environment of his administration has come a desperation, as well as a new candidate for governor. Uh, this candidate uh, is a former Goldman Sachs executive uh, who became ambassador to Germany, never had public office, but uh, is really concerned about making some progressive changes in, in, in the state. Uh, and announced four weeks ago that he was going to do this, 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 and this, all the good things, student loans, small businesses, uh, infrastructure improvements, and so forth. Uh, he's going to, and he said, now I know how you, you know, you're going to ask me, where are we going to get the money for this? Our taxes are already too high. He says, well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Well, first of all, let's just observe something. Last year, New Jersey spent $1.5 billion in building the roads and the bridges and the railroads future in Japan, pointing out that the money that New Jersey has on deposit is in Wall Street, which is invests, it invests in Japan, and makes the money there. It says, we are going to create a state-owned public bank, and we're going to build, we're going to use that as our foundation, our bedrock, for transforming or for changing the way New Jersey does business. We're going to keep our money at home invest in ourselves and we're going to put the state back on its track. Now, that's a very exciting development because this guy is a mainstream Democrat. Uh, but, but more than that, uh, in the last couple of weeks, it turns out that he is now the likely winner. He is the likely next governor of New Jersey. Uh, all of his, his opponents have pulled out. The environment is really there. It's, it's kind of uh, a campaign for him to lose. Now, that's going to change the environment here. When I told that to people in California, uh, they, their, their, some of their governor candidates are, are sort of interested uh, in this, but it accelerates the interest and the acceptability of it. Now, you guys have had a, a history of, around of creating some public bank momentum, has been shortchanged and stopped, I think, in large part by some of the big bank influence. Uh, but uh, this is a, uh, an emerging reality. And in other states, in states around the country, we have New Hampshire and uh, Michigan, Illinois, uh, Vermont, just in Maryland, uh, all, uh, um, Washington State has a bill as well. Uh, California is likely to have one next year. Arizona, these are state house initiatives for legislation, but there are lots of cities also that are getting on board looking at this, like uh, Philadelphia, for example, and Pittsburgh. Uh, they're, they're making great progress. That's the fifth largest city in the state. I'm telling you this to report on the positive horizon for public banking because you're not alone if this is what you want to create. Uh, but it is, a, uh, it is a time for us to grab hold of this momentum uh, and to use the money that's in our basement 
uh, to be able to move our way forward. I say use our money in the basement because this is all working with the assets that this city already has. You know, you have money that's stashed in treasures, funds, uh, and a variety of other rainy day funds that could be leveraged or redeployed for investment into this bank. Now, that is a, it's a process of uh, community support and, uh, and, and uh, targeting or identifying what the mission of the bank wants to be. But the mission, the mission can be anything that the stakeholder interests decide and that everybody agrees to. That we're going to use this bank for supporting student loans or we're going to maybe support cooperative development or small businesses or supporting infrastructure or supporting partnering on creating new affordable homes for residents and so forth. So it is a, it, it's kind of a bit of a blank check, but it has to make sense. Uh, and it also needs to reflect you and your interests and where you want to have uh, your money go. So uh, that is where the future money can come from to afford the future uh, that you want for Portland. Uh, you've got an enormous uh, equity, personal equity and assets of public support and intelligence to create something new here. Uh, there is just a need to organize. And I think you can, when you, when you see the environment of, that, that who's in control now needs to be moved aside, respectfully, you know, but moved aside. The people are going to have to organize this approach. You need to, if I may say, you, I think it's easy enough to create a chocolate and vanilla sort of choice. You know, we can either continue to go into more debt and higher taxes by continuing to rely on the investment of private money. Or we can fund a bank, capitalize a bank with money we already have, and start to make loan money to ourselves. We can start very safely by refinancing some of the bond debt, some of the debt that we already have. Let's loan the money to ourselves. You know, you know where the, where the client lives. You know, you're not going anywhere. You, and you've got a reliable source of ability to pay it back. Uh, so if you start to characterize those choices, with real numbers, and then you, and you bring to the city administration and to your neighbors these choices so that they can say, well, why would we continue to do this when we can do this? Then I think you, you start to build a kind of populist, real uh, campaign uh, and capability of moving something forward for the city that will allow uh, the future bond issues to at least be confronted, if not hopefully refinanced. Uh, instead of having to go into more and more and more debt. There is no end to that, unless you debt and taxes, debt and taxes, you know, you've heard debt and taxes, it's debt and taxes, as long as you don't have the means to create the, uh, the alternative. The alternative is, all right, we'll take our money and we'll create new value, new equity, and, and, and in the process we'll create new capability, and we'll invest in more and more and more, and so you'll have a snowballing effect of wealth true common wealth that will reflect your values and your intentions. There's, a, there's an example in, uh, in North Dakota that I think is just really terrific. Because they make so much money. It's a seven billion dollar bank. They have 700,000 people in it, which part of Portland is there, or maybe that's, a, uh, you know, it's perhaps a quote, I don't know what your population here is, but it's a, uh, they have a big bank, a small number of people, they've got money to think about to use creatively. So in the state, in the state house uh, about a year ago, a measure came forward, a proposal came forward to invent, to say, look, why don't we take, why don't we provide a, a birth inheritance kind of a dividend for being born in North Dakota? If you get born here, um, we'll vest you with $5,000 right at birth. And we'll take that money and we'll put it into our bank. 20 years later, if you're still here, and if you're interested in, in staying here, you can have that $5,000 and the money that it has accrued in that period of time. And you can do one of three things. You can go to school, build a house, and start a business. You know, this is the kind of smart investing in communities that care about each other and want to create the mechanics of, of growth, prosperity, health, fairness, justice, those are the kinds of options you suddenly have in this city. Wow, you guys, who knows what you guys would do if you had your own bank with that kind of strength. 
Now, we do, an, we do analyses of uh, what cities have available, and I, I'm not gonna get into any of that uh, about Portland's numbers now, but um, you really do have a great wealth that you are letting stay in the basement. I like that analogy. If you want to redo your kitchen and you've got a million dollars downstairs, but you go next door and borrow it from your neighbor and pay him something for the first pitch, you know, it's, it doesn't make any sense. So this is the way that we re-democratize our control of our wealth, our city, uh, and our politics. Because we don't want to forget that money speaks and the rest of us walk uh, unless we're able to, to participate in the policy making decisions of what we're going to be doing with our resources. I think with that, I'm going to stop and, uh, and, and just encourage you to, to take this opportunity to, to realize that it's only going to happen if each one of you participates and in, bring, in doing what you can, in bringing your expertise, the connections, uh, the, and, uh, your insights uh, and your participation uh, into this process. And I do believe that once you make it clear, the case clear, characterize it with real data, that you will begin to carry the day. That people will want to be on your side and stop complaining and get on with, uh, with what they want to create. So uh, I'll end there and open it up for questions. services industry, which is paper, that's, you know, just 
paper. It's not real productivity. But private investment can be real, is another matter beside public investment. So pension funds, which are invested in, in these vehicles, uh, are, are playing in that marketplace. We would say that the, the public bank shouldn't go there. In fact, for a lot of reasons, it shouldn't go there. This is the public's money. We want it to be invested here so that the returns and the growth happens inside Portland or inside Oregon uh, instead of being shipped off. Uh, and I think that's a, a very important distinction, just as we would make a distinction between the Wall Street banks and the community banks and credit unions who are doing the very important work of lending credit into our local communities. Um, the Wall Street banks don't, don't care about that anymore. They're not something they're making their money. Why should they take the risk when start, you're starting your business? But the community banks are uh, making most of the loans, and by the way, most of the local loans, most of the local uh, small business loans, that's where most of the jobs come from. And because most of us are getting excluded from the global economy, either through technology, robotics, uh, or just more obviation from being set away in other countries, uh, we have a need to begin to organize ourselves more uh, efficiently on a local basis. A bank would be a great thing to have to support uh, that, uh, that need. Um, and there's another reason why we shouldn't uh, be invested with public scholars in Wall Street banks. There's great risk. We've seen them fail already. Uh, a lot of observers think that it's imminent that they will fail again. Uh, when they fail next time, the rules have been changed. You know, you've, you may have heard about bail-in instead of bail-out. The bail-out was the government was going to rebalance the bad banks' books. Uh, now it's bail-in. So they will, uh, have, they will take the shareholders' money first, and then they'll take the unsecured depositors' money next. And the unsecured depositors are you, me, Portland, the city of Portland, the state of Oregon, all of that at risk when the, when the, the bank collapse ha happens next. Now, <laughs> the Dodd-Frank uh, strategy was also devised so that the people who will get paid out first when the bank fails are the derivatives holders. Now it's the derivatives holders who are the big banks themselves. Uh, they are the ones that are way bigger than any sort of insurance that could possibly happen. So they're going to get all the money. There won't be anything left for us. We'll get chips in a bad bank. You know, and imagine the city trying to pay, uh, pay uh, do payroll or anything else. Uh, with its $100 million no longer available to it. It's happened already, okay? We've seen it in Greece, we've seen Cyprus, other places around the world. So we are at risk by that. And if in that eventuality, for just maybe that just reason alone, it would be smart for us to have uh, a, a, a new uh, institution. And it occurs to me too that when we talk about banking, you know, it's become so, uh, strange you know, with the aberrant behavior and the, the criminal behaviors of these people that the profession itself has really been sullied completely. And so you know the community bankers and credit unions are doing an important public service. Everybody thinks bankers are all, all the same crowd. Well it with the public banking theme or with that with that uh, uh, environment we have a chance to kind of uh, put integrity back into the profession uh, and to support our community businessmen who are bankers uh, and, and uh, you know, kind of hold them up and protect them. I don't know if you guys know, but we've, we're using thousands of <coughs> banks over the last several years, uh, and that's a trend that is not likely to stop unless they have uh, some support, and I think public banking would be one of the greatest supports of
working in a little bit of a riskier environment, I suppose, because they're lending to you and me uh, and to our friends who are trying to start businesses, which are a bit of a precarious deal. The cost of regulation is onerous, uh, and that's one of the things that, too, we think the public bank could help community institutions, financial institutions, uh, do more efficiently by helping them with some of that back office process. So it's a low, it's a tough regulatory environment, low interest, uh, and then of course there's a riskier sort of a, of, of a lending environment. Um, the, what happens then, as I indicated before, is that when the community banks go away, and you want to go for a loan, uh, and you go to Wells Fargo, or you go to Bank of America, or whatever, uh, your name gets put into a computer, and your factors get put in there, and you know, uh, they, if, if for some reason it doesn't wash, you don't get the money. Um, community banks are much more personal. They know you, they know where you live, they might have a relationship with you already. Um, and so they would be much, might be, they are going to become your partners in supporting your business being a success. Uh, and that, of course, is important because it vitalizes our communities, our local communities, where these new businesses need to spread out. I mean, we want to create all kinds of new businesses that are focused on what people can actually do in the community. Uh, so, but once they go away, then, we're, then these uh, entrepreneurs and, uh, with the initiative and the energy, we're gonna have to rely on things like friends or credit cards. So there again, the money starts leaving home right away. You're gonna pay for your money extremely at a high expense, and the money is going to leave town. Whereas if you do your banking locally, you can stay here. And that, of course, then creates a, a much more Vibrant the prospect. Yes. My impression is that credit unions are doing relatively well these days. Yeah. And uh, so, what's what's the credit union relationship to? Uh, why why would they be doing better than community banks? And what would their relationship be to a public bank? Yeah, uh, I, I don't know uh, the difference between community banks and credit unions relative to why they're doing better. I understand they're doing really well, in part because I think a lot of people did move their money from one to the other. But the relationship to the public bank is nothing uh, directly, necessarily direct. But we're certainly not competing. I, I said earlier with the, the partnership relationship. But we, the public bank uh, could move new lines of business, new lend, lines of lending into the community, let's say for small businesses, or let's say for affordable homes. Uh, and they would work, th it would work through the community banks and the credit unions uh, to be able to distribute and to qualify and to oversee, manage, and to husband those loans uh, as, as they go on. So the public bank then doesn't get bogged down in dealing with the very variables and the vagaries, perhaps, even of, the, of, of dealing with the public. Uh, and of course, the, they're already suited for it. They've got. They've got the tellers, they've got the branches, they've got uh, the, the technology. Uh, they're already in the business. Why not use them? The public bank then gets to, uh, if part of the mission of the bank is to support small businesses, uh, and you're a small business man, it, it, we would, it, it, they would much rather, they would have us if you go to the community bank uh, and work through there. Now, the community bank, the cool thing about that is the community bank is going to say, you know, I really like your, like, I know you, your business plan makes sense, uh, and uh, you're just starting out, and you've had a previous business, and so forth and so on. Um, we have this line of lending that the public bank supports, because if we want to have more of this in the community, let me run it by the public bank and see whether or not you qualify, or there would be qualifications that would be already issued and say, you qualify for this low 1% interest for five years, up to $200,000, as they do in North Dakota, okay? You know, that's, uh, so, uh, the, the local financial institutions in North Dakota prosper like nowhere else in the country. Their profits are three to four times better than anywhere else in the country, and they've got more, per, more uh, local banks per capita than anywhere in the U.S. as well. They love their public bank, uh, the, the North Bank of North Dakota. They have a very close, close relationship. And to show also about what an impact it makes on the, on the uh, democracy there, uh, the uh, uh, deposits that are held by the community banks are about 70% of the deposits are in community banks. 
The rest are in the big banks. That's a flip. That's a complete heads up flip of how it normally is. Most people have their money in the big banks, but the local community banks are thriving. Something else that was pretty cool about that, because they had a bank, the economy, the, the, North, the people in North Dakota long ago, I think in the 30s, uh, decided to not allow companies that would come in from out of state, like big franchise pharmacies and other things like that. Uh, and, and so that all of the businesses there are, were, were supported. You know, you had a local business, you had, you had a shop. Um, there was a, uh, a, an election or a ballot measure of this in June, uh, which was meant to overturn that, a campaign that was heavily funded by the Walmarts and the CVS to overturn this, let's, let's let the franchise guy in. The North Dakotans said, no, thank you. We're not gonna have any of that here. The, 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 this is North Dakota, it's not really the city of Chicago. <laughs> so uh, it just sets up that kind of environment where the people actually have the power and, and experience of, 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 of influence and policy. Yes, sir. Um, so I just want to make a couple comments and then get to a question. But uh, one about the credit unions, you know, I have a mortgage through a great local credit union advantage, but when we got our mortgage, I asked them, so will you keep this mortgage or are you going to sell it off? I'm not sure if they securitize it or just sell, sell it off, but they basically said, we're going to sell it off, and that's what all credit unions do. And if you don't want us to sell it off, we will either charge you more points or a higher interest rate. Mm -hmm. And um, my understanding is that unlike um, banks, credit unions can't create credit or money like banks do, right? That credit unions basically um, are a cooperative of the depositors' savings or um, you know, deposits, whereas um, banks could actually, instead of um, loaning money after deposits, they actually create money in loaning it, right? And that's right. something that credit unions right. can't do. And so if we have a public bank, instead of our local credit unions having to sell sell off our mortgages to some who knows whether it's Wall Street or whatever bank, they could sell it off to um, the municipal bank and the municipal bank could have a steady income stream whenever we pay our mortgages um, and you know the profit would come to the city and so on and we as consumers could still get a much better deal. Yeah. Um, but the other thing I want to get to and then finally I'll get to a question is um, so I'm on the Portland Socially Responsible Investment Committee, um, which is appointed, you know, it was created um, because people were concerned about our public money being invested in everything from fossil fuels to Walmart to all kinds of corporations. Um, and I, I'm not speaking, I can't speak here as a representative of the committee, I'm speaking just as an individual who's on the committee. But um, we have our public report um, published and I, I'm going to post it on our event page here. And you can see what our report is. We're putting, I believe, nine or ten companies on the do not buy list, everything from Walmart to Wells Fargo and so on. Um, but the problem is that, you know, when we put those companies on the do not buy list, our treasurer, treasurer's analysis is that we depend on um, income from those investments right now. Um, and that if we do not invest in these horrible corporations, um, which we have a lot of good reasons not to invest in them, the difference between the returns on those um, corporate bonds or commercial paper and um, treasuries would be something like up to about $4 million a year. So not only would we be losing $4 million a year in our budget, we're also paying and it's not only for that bond, the housing bond, which I think, you know, for the housing crisis we do need to support, but all the other bonds we have, we're paying all this extra money, millions and millions of dollars, to Wall Street on the other hand. Um, and so please come out, find out more about this. We have public testimony scheduled from 2 to 5 p.m. on November 30th, Wednesday. I will be testifying there and city council will be voting on that. And that gives us a perfect window of opportunity to make the case why we need a public bank because we should not have this, um, we should not be forced into this um, bad um, ethical position where we cannot choose to take money, our money out of um, companies that are investing in for-profit prisons, in, um, you know, engaged in fraud and not worry about losing money for the city.
um, and investing in our local economy instead. But finally, I want to get to the question. Um, you know, there's all kinds of GoFundMe's and these kinds of, um, you know, socially raised um, funding things that are happening that, you know, support a lot of great projects and causes. But what I found that every single one of them, um, between the fees and the interest that get paid, so whenever you want to help out a teacher or whatever cause, a film project, music project, you basically end up paying between 9 and about 20% to middlemen for, for the fees. Now, is there a way that we can have either work with the credit union or have a public bank where we can have those kind of socially funded kind of things and <coughs> give people a much better deal? There's no, there's no reason people should be paying you know, 9 to 20% when we want to fund people's projects. Thanks, John. Thanks for that insight, too. By the way, if you guys want to uh, see the, the, the first annual report, you can go to Oregon, PortlandOregon.gov and, uh, and look for the socially responsible investment thing and see those companies. I actually have them right here. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, this idea of helping to fund um, a variety of, uh, of projects in town, I don't see why uh, there wouldn't be some way to orchestrate. Once you have a pool of money, and people, if people wanted to make deposits, uh, it could be, it conceivably could be a flow loop. Uh, you know, you're, you're dealing with the money of the people, and if it's consistent with the mission of the bank, as you guys would determine, uh, seems to me that would be a real possibility. You mentioned uh, about the mortgage market. Uh, one of the things that the Bank of North Dakota does is become a secondary mortgage market for the community banks. Uh, and that allows them then to, they sell the mortgages to the, the, to the Bank of North Dakota, the BND uh, bundles that and uh, for investors, and it becomes a money center bank. So you really get a, a financial engine going on there that uh, is using money in a very uh, exciting and, and productive way while uh, reinforcing the strength of the community organizations. Because, you know, once, uh, you know, banks are limited by their capital as to how much they can give, and if they don't have the liquidity to be able to make the loans, they're just kind of out of, they have nowhere to go. Whereas with a public bank, they can, they can loan, make much larger loans, and, and that's why these businesses profit, profit, uh, prosper. Yeah. All right. So let me ask you then about that. Would the uh, a state bank be securitizing those mortgage loans and selling them to investment banks? Yes. They that's as, uh, as I understand. Yeah. That would be right. the way. Yeah, they, they would scourge your Wall Street right there. <laughs> so, I mean, would they be getting... But, but as long as the, you know, it, uh, what's important is the quality of collateral. You know, so if the, if the, more, if the mortgage-backed securities are, are worth something, then, you know, you really have a, a strong asset. Because what we saw with the uh, mortgage-backed securities before was it was fraudulent. You know? Right. Yeah. But I think when, when the mortgage meltdown happened, all Wall Street banks lost money, but the Bank of North Dakota did not lose a penny. Yeah, it's a big, most profitable year they have. Yes. Yeah, two questions, closely related. Uh, we know about the Bank of North Dakota. Where else is there a state bank or a government entity in North America, the United States or Canada, that has this kind of bank? Uh, well.
I mean, this is a lesson for us all. They failed because they were tied in with making risky loans, making loans that the banks wouldn't handle, that, you know, that they, were, they wanted to stimulate bis uh, businesses that didn't have viable business plans or that were connected to crony interests. Uh, and it is that confluence and commingling of crony, self-interested players that, that when you create your public bank, you need to create the architecture uh, that, the, the, that will separate those two. And that can be done. That can absolutely be done. But it's an important thing to keep in mind. It's a lesson. That really is my second question. Uh -huh. uh, in North Dakota, and if you were proposing it, proposing for the city of Portland, mm -hmm. how do you suggest we structure the governing of the bank yeah. itself? Where do we find the people? Uh, how do we vet them? Vet them? Yeah. How do we manage them? How do we handle the management yeah. of this entity? Yeah. You, the great question. And and a really an important one in understanding some of the next steps. These are questions that have to be answered in, uh, in, through uh, an informed group of people who are familiar with how this is done. North Dakota provides a really good model because they haven't had that problem. But, the, but looking at their model, uh, you have kind of a <coughs> two arm length distance between the loans that are decided upon and the, and the political and private interests that are running the government. So that in North Dakota, the governor and the secretary of the agriculture and the attorney general uh, appoint the board of directors. And the board of directors has got a rotating terms, uh, limits that are outside of the political cycle. Uh, and the board of directors represents certain interests. They're all financial experts, or financially experienced. Uh, you might represent the, the community bankers, uh, the chamber of commerce, citizens, stakeholder interests, and others. Uh, but that would be something for, for the community to decide. And I would say that it would probably make sense to limit the number of appointees that the lead, that the government administrators uh, provide uh, in the overall mix of the board. But the board then is making the decisions about the loans. They are hiring the bank administration. And the bankers are bankers. They're not, they're, they are not people who will make their community development loans, they're not looking to, to, to get rid of the money, uh, they're not dealing with block grants, they are bankers who know how to assess risk and know how to say no. And that's really safety for the people's money. Now, I can, and, and of course the bank has a mission, so it only lends within a certain parameter of, of understood, this is what we're going to do with our money, we finance our public debt, we can work with students and so forth and so on, uh, but the bankers make, uh, help to uh, create the, the the, the actual loan decisions, the politics and the, and the crony connections are distant, but that's a really critical uh, thing. Now, they've been doing it great in North Dakota. You might say they're a little bit different out there uh, because they have you know, maybe a more communal sense. They know each other, you see the governor at the gas station, and you know, that's, that they have quality. But this is a town too, you know, where you know each other, and I think there might be some, some mileage in that. So, does that does that address it over for now? Yeah. I, I'll, I'll just say that in New Jersey, what we're doing, uh, that what PBI is doing in New Jersey, because it looks like our next governor is going to, uh, uh, is planning to build a state bank, we are, I'm gathering people who are stakeholders from around, who are union people, teachers, uh, working in economic council, um, uh, a host of others that will be meeting in a task force begin to work through some of these questions and begin to build, put some shape around what we want this bank to look like or what we hope it will look like to help the governor-to-be uh, uh, navigate that and get through, but also to build public support. And I really think this is an exciting part of the process. If we decide we want to have a public bank, then we start to meet our neighbors and say, what could we, what, what could we do 